Good morning, everyone who I can't see. I think there's about 65 people on this uh, webinar right now. And um, I, all I can see is myself. <laughs> so I'm going to need to imagine that there's 65 people out there on their, on their laptops, maybe their hands wrapped around a cup of tea while the rain falls. So um, yes, the rain has just started to fall here uh, where I am, which is on the, the banks of the Yarra or the Birrarung, uh, Birrarung Ma down in Fairfield in Melbourne. So I wanted to start with um, an acknowledgement of country uh, to give my respects, pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and all the elders past, present and emerging. And I certainly feel um, the presence of their ongoing and, and um, generational caretakership as I, um, as I caretake this little piece of land here on the, on, the, on the Yarra, right on the edge of the river. And I have great um, gratitude for, for being able to live and exist and draw so much um, joy and nourishment from this, from this river. And I imagine a lot of you are probably upstream of me up in the, the catchment up in the Yarra Ranges. So um, if anyone had any other acknowledgements they, they wanted to, to give, if you're, if you're on different country um, to Wurundjeri, please use the chat function. Um, in lieu of us not being able to, to see each other, this is where we can, um, this is where we can communicate. Um, you can communicate with, with each other and you can select all panelists and attendees and yeah, type in any comments or thoughts as we go along. Um, I will be able to see some, but I probably won't have time to see all of them, but um, please don't let that stop you. It's, it's the way that we can communicate. So um, I also wanted to acknowledge just this time that we're in. We're not, we're not meeting together in, a, in what was the, the normal. Um, we're meeting together in a time of um, great uncertainty with this um, COVID pandemic, global pandemic, and the changes, the huge changes that we've all been asked to make and have been making um, to really limit our um, movement, limit our, um, our, con our contact and our connection with, with, um, with our community. And I know that that's been really difficult for a lot of people and, and also has, has brought some really surprising opportunities and, um, and gifts as well. So I want to acknowledge this time that we're in and also the, the greater time of this, um, this kind of ecological crisis or this time of what one of my teachers calls the great turning, Joanna Macy calls it the great turning, which is um, refers to this kind of epochal time that we're in, which is um, a transitional time. We don't know what it's transitioning to, but we know that it's the sixth extinction spasm on earth, that there's runaway climate change. And we have this period of time where we're asking ourselves collectively the question, are we going to move towards um, a life affirming culture, a life affirming um, society? So this is the great turning that we're all part of. So, uh, I wanted to just, yeah, start with, well, what are we, what are we actually going to talk about today? It's um, definitely going to be partly interactive. There's going to be polls. There's going to be quizzes. I hope you've all got a pen and paper ready. It's not just going to be me talking at you. Unfortunately, I can't, um, I can't hear any of you, but um, we're going to make it as interactive as possible. But really the question that I'm bringing this morning is how do we, how might we explore a deeper connection with the natural world. In other words, I'm really interested in what connects us and what disconnects us. Uh, so what are the practices? What are the ways of being? What are the opportunities that we have to connect deeper with the more than human world? And it's a great word, the great phrase, this more than human world. Thank you, David Abram, for this. Um, another way of saying it is the other than human world, because of course, we're nature, everything is nature. Um, but what we're talking about is how we can extend our family, our kinship, our sense of, um, of community to include 
the more than human world, all the myriad of amazing, incredible life forms um, that we are surrounded by and inspire us and um, give us a sense of home and belonging and, and um, inspiration. So the way I'd like to start any of my discussions and talks is with gratitude, because that is one of the practices of, of connection. So I'd like to start with some, um, certainly some gratitude for this rain, which is falling outside my window. And um, I would love to give some gratitude. And I have great, yeah, great thanks in my heart for the full moon that was um, these last, this last week, a few days ago. And the beautiful time that I spent um, greeting the full moon with a friend down by the wetland and um, really soaking in that, that moonlight. It's really something so special to have that, that direct contact with, with the moon and when it's not a cloudy night and when it's, we've got the space to actually be outside. And that, that evening was just so nourishing for me. And I can see someone else is, is, is giving thanks to the full moon, but please, any gratitude that you hold right now, any, anything that you can give thanks for, um, or that's, you know, that's just spontaneously there, what you could reflect on with gratitude this morning, please put it in the chat. I'd love to, I'd love to track some of what, some of what you're all feeling grateful for this morning. And I know a lot of people are feeling grateful for this, um, this pause, this kind of sacred pause in a way to all our usual busyness, our usual, um, kind of flurry of moving from A to B, from appointment to appointment, from um, work to socialising, uh, to family responsibilities. And for a lot of people, there has been a, a sense of, wow, this is actually, this period of time is actually helping me to, to get back to what I really love, to kind of really look at the priorities in my life. And for some people that, that has been a, a kind of um, putting the focus back on, on some connection time with nature and some, and some deep nature time, some really slow wandering time. And I wanted to mention a few ways that I have heard that nature itself is being given a reprieve in this time of, um, of kind of pulling back and slowing down and peeling back. And there's a few incredible stories that have really moved me about the benefits that nature is, is experiencing from this, from this period of time. One of the, the more moving ones for me has been around the, the whales. And since there's been a kind of 30 to 40% drop in, um, in noise pollution and vibration from shipping and, and other things that affect whales, um, apparently they are able to hear each other in migration for the first time in, well, my lifetime. And that is just such an incredible um, story to soak in and to imagine that um, the joy or the opportunity that that offers um, not just whales, but ocean creatures with the, with the reduction in noise pollution. I've also heard of people seeing stars for the first time in some of the city areas, um, given the, the uh, lack of um, air pollution. And in Northern India, people are seeing the Himalayas in certain um, cities and villages, the Himalayas two, 200 kilometers away, they're actually seeing, seeing for the first time. I'm loving all the, um, the gratitude that's coming through in the, in the chat. Uh, I heard in America that it's, there's been coyotes spotted on the Golden Gate Bridge for the first time. And, um, and a friend of mine said that um, the, the mountain lions are coming right into town in Boulder in Colorado there because of the lack of, um, the lack of traffic. And for me, there's been a, um, I've been able to, especially over Easter when, when we really were um, pretty still collectively, I could hear the, the colony of grey-headed flying foxes downstream from me, um, which usually I can't hear. And so that was really special to just wake up one morning and oh, I can't hear peak time traffic from the Eastern Freeway. I can actually hear the, the grey-headed flying foxes. So if there's anything else that you've noticed, please, please add it to the chat, how, how nature has been benefiting from this time. So I'd like to throw in a, in a poll and um, Jen's going to, to put this in the mix. This poll is, I'm really curious whether you have had been able to experience more nature connection time while in lockdown. Um, so the poll is, have you spent more or less time in nature since lockdown? So a lot more time, somewhat more time, 
somewhat less time or a lot less time because people's circumstances have all changed. Um, so please put your vote in, your vote, your, um, your poll response in, and we'll get a bit of a sense of whether we, we are actually outside more or less. I'm really curious. So I think, um, Jen, you might be able to post in the chat um, the results when they pop in. Hey Claire, yeah, so I'm just watching the results come through now. So we've had, uh, we've got the winner currently is uh, somewhat more time at 55%. And then next is a lot more time at 22%. Somewhat less time is 15% and a lot less time is 8%. So I'll give everyone another moment to just complete that and then I'll put those all those results in the chat. Wow, and someone did, did just point out we haven't, there's no option for the same amount of time. True, this is true. Um, sorry about that. But that's, that's, really, that's really interesting to me. Um, somewhat more time being um, the most common response and, and the second being a lot more time. Uh, so that's kind of what I, what I thought was happening. And, and I've certainly noticed in my parkland, um, there's, there's more people, there's definitely more people. And that gives me a lot of joy and it, it makes me wonder um, if there's been some, some deeper connections formed. So one of the ways I want to kind of talk about nature connection today is through the sense of belonging. And I'm going to unpack that word belonging um, a little more. But firstly, I'd love to... Um, so here we go, the results, a lot more time, 22%, somewhat more time, 55%. Yep. And a lot less, 9%. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for that. But um, overwhelmingly more time. So I want to take you, uh, with this question of belonging, take you on a brief little wander with me. And this was um, a wander that I went on yesterday with a friend, um, with, with 1.5 metres between us. I wandered through my suburbs. And I want to just take you, and, and as I take you on this wander, I invite you to... See if you can wander with me in your mind's eye. If, if any of these images or um, sensory experiences that I relate, you can actually feel them in your body. So I started at my house and the first thing I um, noticed when I woke up in the morning before my wander was that the privet was fruiting. And I took my cup of tea outside and the spotted turtle doves were, were in the privet feeding off the, the fruit. And then the red rumped parrots came and joined them. And then a, a flock of silver eyes just, just whizzed through with their little whistles. And then I walked out the front gate and I went on a um, kind of a two hour wander through, through the suburbs. So through the streets of Fairfield and Alfington. And what I saw was um, I saw things flowering. So the proteas were flowering. There was beautiful grevilleas flowering. Uh, there was the, it was a really curious ant trail that I followed along the, along the pavement, followed and followed and followed until um, it, it went up a tree and it was the largest tree in the, that we found in the neighbourhood. We put our hands on the tree, it was probably a river red gum, and just felt that the roughness of the bark, we could see the, the eggs on the, on the ants, the ants carrying the eggs and, and wondered whether it related to, to the rain coming today. I noticed a new hole in honey eater in the, in the purple salvia. And I noticed the, the river level was, was higher, but it, was, it, was, it had dropped so I could see the high water mark from the last week. And I found a, a, a tail of a ringtail possum, just the tail, and wondered what had happened to this ringtail possum and, and who had, had munched it in the middle of the night. Maybe it was one of the powerful owls that I've been hearing calling, calling down the river. And what I heard was the screech of rainbow lorikeets as they flew over and found the, the flowering um, ironbarks. And I, and, the, and I saw the blackness of the ironbark trunk and, and the, the rainbow lorikeets in the red flowers sucking the nectar. And I heard a karawang calling and it reminded me of winter and the, and the coming of winter. And I smelt this strange new yellow flower that I'd never seen before. It had a really... Um, a really kind of rough leaf. And I learnt later on, it was a flower called wintergreen, but it smelt spicy like cinnamon. 
and I ate some things as I went. I picked some lily pilly fruit and ate them as we walked. And I, um, I noticed the grapefruit and the pomegranate and the lemons and the last of the tomatoes all fruiting. And I took some red salvia flowers and I sucked the nectar out of them and I ate some dandelion greens. So I ate of the land as well. And I saw some survival materials around me because that's also what I, what I also noticed. I noticed the dianella and the reeds and the rushes um, and the, the dead stalks of the, of the reeds and the rushes that I could use for kindling. And I noticed the paper bark and how it was peeling off and, and noticed um, that I could use that for, for fire making. And I saw where there was firewood out on the footpath and how I could collect firewood for my backyard fire. So all of this was going through my mind um, as I wandered with my friend. And of course, we were talking about life and love and relationships. But always we have this, this one, one, one ear out for what the birds are doing. We're smelling. We're smelling for the roses. We're smelling for what's, what's the honey in the neighbourhood. We're really watching with our wide angle vision. We're not just looking at the footpath and we're really smelling. We're really smelling um, the streets as we go. And there's this question that I ask myself when I'm wandering and I'm often wandering with a friend or sometimes on my own. Am I on the inside or the outside? In other words, is all my attention in my head and I'm just thinking and talking about stories of my life or do I also have my antenna out am i listening am i watching am i smelling am i tasting am i hearing and i wonder if this is a practice that any of you have this sense of when you're outside really being outside really switching on those senses and i'd i'd love to hear of anything on the chat um, of anything you've been noticing any seasonal indicators because we are experiencing a change of season um, we just passed the, the um, equinox not long ago last week. So are you noticing any particular seasonal changes? Do you track the seasonal changes or what are you noticing in your neighbourhood? Flowering or smelling? What have you touched recently that was really visceral and alive and tangible? What has moved you in the natural world? I'd love to, someone saying the, the wattle flowers are coming out already. Wow. And I'm wondering if right now we could even on this chat, even though we're, we're looking at a computer, we could even just close our eyes for a second and, and just listen. Maybe it's listening to the rain. Maybe there's other sounds and just trying to tune into right now, just what's the quietest sound? Just going to give it a few breaths. Just what's the quietest sound I can hear right now? And if something came to you, just putting it in the chat, what's the quietest sound? What can I smell? What can I taste? What can I see? Even just looking around me in the room, can you notice something right now that you've never noticed before? Maybe there's something just like, well, you know what? I get stuck in my awareness rut as well. So what we're, what we're exploring here is this idea of belonging, this idea of being like a sponge on the landscape so that we're not just walking around as if we ended our skin, but really opening to our landscape, whether it's the suburbs or the country, opening to our landscape as if it is part of our larger body, uh, as if we yeah, can extend those strings, those ropes of connection out to the lorikeets, out to the spine bills that are drinking the nectar from the grevilleas, um, out to the iron barks and to the turtles in the river and start the more we notice, the more we notice, the more uh, strong those strings and threads of relationship are. So I'd love to give you a little pop quiz. This is called the tourist test. I'm loving, I'm loving just noticing some of the comments coming in, the currawongs and the gang gangs. Uh, more birds around, yeah, possibly. So if you get a pen and paper, I've got a few questions here, quite a few questions. And this is just giving us a little bit of a reading. Just treat it lightly. This is really not, it's called the tourist test, but don't think of it like an exam. But it gives a little bit of a kind of a general reading, if you like, of how embedded in the landscape we are. 
And don't worry, when I first did this test, I did not get 100% and I probably even wouldn't now. So, um, and I invite you to, to put your answers in the chat, but before you, um, you know, really lock in your answer <laughs> before putting it in the chat, because otherwise um, someone else will give you the answer for you. And, and this really is a, a kind of a, um, a reading, if you like, a bit of a radar on, on how much of a tourist you are in your landscape and, and how embedded you are. So uh, the first question is when you turn the tap on in your kitchen, where is the water coming from and where is the water going to? When you turn the tap on in the kitchen, where is the water coming from? And then when it goes down the drain, when it goes down the plug hole, where does it go to? So we're not gonna go through and, and do a kind of tick and cross, but I am interested if, if people lock in their answer and then, and then put it in the chat, whether there's any uh, correlation, I imagine there would be. But even just thinking of these answers in your mind, if you don't wanna write them down, just, ah, oh, do I know this? Is this something that I'm curious about? Is the other um, kind of reason for this, this little tourist test? Is this, if I don't know it, I wonder if that question actually makes me curious. So the second question is, what plant grows closest to my front door? What plant grows closest to my front door? Could be something in a pot, could be something planted. Just seeing if you, um, if you have an idea. I think for me, it's a um, sweet Bessaria. Another plant question, number three, and I notice there's not many, uh, <laughs> not many, um, answers coming through on the chat. That's okay. Name the nearest wild edible to your house. So again, it could be your front door, or your back door, the nearest wild edible. Um, it could be for most people, it could be probably something like a, a, an edible weed. Yep. Some answers coming through. Someone saying dandelion is the closest one, native mint bush, dandelion. So anything that's, that's non-cultivated. So I think for me, it's, it's an oxalis. Great, I'm enjoying all the, um, the answers coming through. Lots of dandelion and the dandelions are kangaroo apple. Yes, I ate a kangaroo apple on my wanda yesterday. Okay, next question. Why are trees your best friends in a survival situation and name two common trees in your area. Why are trees your best friends in a survival situation? Name two common trees in your area. I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly. Shelter and fuel, yep, that's great. Number four, uh, that five, name a poisonous spider in your area. And what are the key identification marks? Name a poisonous spider in your area. What are the key identification marks? Number six, what is the closest moving water outside your house? And can you point to it? So I'm going to point that way down towards the Yarra but maybe you can point to where the closest moving body of water is outside your house and what it is. Loving seeing these answers. Yeah, I thought red back um, would come in. Creeks, lots of creeks, Fernie Creek. Uh, number seven, what phase is the moon in right now? What phase is the moon in right now? I did, I did give a hint in my introduction. Yeah, just past full, that's right. So it's waning. Full on Thursday, it was full on Thursday night. So no, number eight, name, name five mammals that likely live within a few hundred meters of your house. Name five mammals that likely live within a few hundred meters of your house. And number nine, which direction does the cold, clear weather usually come in from? Which direction does the cold, clear weather, well, like today's weather, which direction did today's weather come in from? So 
southwest, south, yep. And yes, loving those mammal um, answers coming in. And of course, cat and dog can be counted. Okay, number 10. What plant growing, and these are, some of these are getting a bit more difficult. What plant growing locally is known traditionally to be good for bites or stings? What plant growing locally is known traditionally to be good for bites and stings? Yes, I thought bracken would come in. If anyone has tried that, you can crush up a bit of bracken stem and put the, um, the juice on a bite. It's really good. And, and dock for sure. Plantain, yep. What is one wild edible, what is one wild edible that's fruiting in your area right now? One wild edible that's fruiting in your area. Someone has mentioned it in this chat already, one that I know of. Um, and don't worry if you're not getting any of these. This is, this is again, just, um, just a kind of a curiosity uh, motivator. Yes, kangaroo apple and lily pilly in my street. Um, prickly currant bush. Oh, that's exciting. Wonderful. All right, two more questions. What are three plants that you could use for tinder? Tinder being the really finest, finest material for like a tinder bundle. What are three plants you could use for tinder for a fire? And where are they in relationship to you? If you, if you needed to go and collect a really fine um, bundle of tinder, what's three different plants that you could use? Yep, someone's put bulrush, which is one of mine. Paper bark, native grasses, dry grass. Yep, fantastic. And yeah, stringy bark. Stringy bark's fantastic. You can crush it up really fine. All right, this is the last question. How do you know if a twig is good for kindling? There's a really simple answer. How do you know if a twig is good for kindling? Yep, it snaps. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks everyone for all your answers coming in. I'm really enjoying seeing them. Um, and we're going to have a poll. And this is just to get a bit of a reading of, of how did we do in the tourist test. So the poll is, did you get three or correct or under, six correct or under, nine or under, or did you get 13? Maybe you got all of them. There we go. There's the poll. So um, this is, the poll's anonymous, remember, no one's going to be um, giving you gold stars or red crosses. It's 13 questions. So when I did this test and, and when it was when I first moved here, it was a bit of a, um, it was a bit humbling. I really didn't, didn't know my landscape, but after three years of living here, I'm really, I'm really getting to know it. Some people are, are bravely putting their poll results in the chat um, yeah, and that's a great point, um, Meg, that you know your landscape, but don't know the words. That's right. So naming, naming things on the landscape is only really one way of knowing. So here we have, okay, pretty good. Nine, nine or under, correct? And then 13 or under, I don't know, we've got 34, six or under. Um, okay. So about, about half, about halfway. That's really great. Kind of a understanding of where you where the gaps are in your awareness and, and for me when I did this test a few years ago when I first moved here it for me it was instead of a kind of a oh I'm really a bit of a tourist here um, it made me want to know what is what are the edibles in my street and sometimes I can it's almost like after three years I can kind of like rise up like an eagle and get a, an eagle-eye perspective of my streets and I could map where all the edible plants are and the fox den and the ringtail um, dray, you know, the nest, the, the, the nest that they have or the brown goshawk nest down by the river or where the ducks um, roost at night. So those kinds of things, the more you take notice of your landscape, um, the more you can kind of map and understand um, the patterns of, of relationship. And so this is what I wanted to briefly touch on is this sense of um, what, what, what does it mean to kind of belong to a landscape? And it, it really is on a spectrum, of course, on one end of the spectrum, it's kind of like an astronaut where we have absolutely no connection with the, um, with our food sources or our, all the elements. We're just kind of 
um, plug into the system and, and, and don't even have any idea what's around us. And then the other end of the spectrum would be if we grew up in traditional, um, you know, intimate relationship with the land hunter gatherer culture, then we would have um, a much, you know, a very, a very embedded relationship with the land. There'd be a sense of, of home. And this is what I'm really interested in is how we can in this day and age start to cultivate um, not just a sense of nature appreciation or recreation or enjoyment, which are all fantastic um, qualities, but really how we can start to put our roots down so we can belong. Um, so we can have this greater and greater and greater sense of belonging because, of course, it's, it's, it's layers and layers of, of belonging um, that we can tap into. And the good news is that it's totally available to us. Um, and it's not through the quantity of time spent in nature. So you don't need to live outside. Um, it's, it's about the quality of time spent in nature. And there's simple repeatable practices that you can do um, to really embed yourself in the landscape. Um, now, I wanted to share just a few slides. I'm just going to share, um, share screen. I wanted to just show you a few slides from um, when I decided to go um, and spend a year, see if I can, here we go, and spend a year out in the, in the woods. Uh, because I had come to see that I was feeling, you know, I was one of the tourists. I was one of these people who live on the land and don't actually know what the first bird of the morning is. And that's another great question, by the way. What's the first bird of the morning in your area? I didn't know which way the storms came in from. I didn't know what I could eat on the land. I didn't know what I could make fire from. And so I spent 12 months um, out in the forest building my own shelter from materials made from the land, uh, lighting fires by rubbing sticks together only uh, because I wanted to get really proficient in these earth skills, in these ancestral life ways, these ways that have been for majority of human history, these have been our birthright. Um, these have been all the skills and the ways of, of knowing the land that we would have been enculturated into just naturally. Um, and so I apprenticed myself uh, to nature. I apprenticed myself to the more than human world. So you can see some kind of little river mussels in that clay pot there. Um, and here's a water lily that I was um, harvesting to, to, for food. So every day I would, I would gather some form of my food um, and I would light my fires by rubbing sticks together. And I would wander the land without, without time or destination. I really apprenticed myself in a way that was not about learning about nature but learning from nature and it one of the most powerful practices was this this image here of my sit spot my, some of you may have heard um, of a sit spot and it's it's literally finding one place in your in your very um, immediate environment. So think of it as like five maximum 10 minutes walk from your house where you go to as regularly as you can and you get to know this place like the back of your hand. You get to know it in the, in the daytime, in the nighttime, in the wind, in the rain, every season. You know where the four directions are. You know what birds are there. You know where the birds live. You know what the routines of the birds and the animals are. You get to know what insects come through. And you get to know these things as if they're your relatives, um, as if they're kin. And this is, this is kind of the baseline of this sense of belonging is, is understanding um, the world through the patterns of nature, you know, through the patterns that we make, that we make the connections. Like when the, when the rain's coming, then this is what the ants do. Or when the, pa when the paper barks start flowering, then these are the birds that come and feed here. And so instead of um, walking for miles and miles across the landscape, um, we get to know one place really well. I'm just going to stop that share now and come back. And 
I wanted to, to kind of ask you whether anyone has a sit spot. Does anyone here have a sit spot? And you can, you can load it in the, in the, in the, um, in the chat. Because a sit spot is really, it's like the, the classroom. It's like going to this one place and that's where you start joining the dots. That's where you start um, really turning the pages of the book of nature. And we're running out of time and I really want to leave some room for questions, but I wanted to just show you one more slide. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, because the slide I want to show you is, this idea well it's two slides this idea that we have a connective system there is part of us that has an instinctive longing to connect and this is a quote from um, one of my mentors john young who's an incredible um, bird language expert and tracker and village builder and anthropologist and he's been studying like what connects us and what disconnects us and he says we have this instinctive longing to connect and our systems long for ways to connect and he's come up with with these these are uh, list of 13 practices which we can practice at home in our backyard that are really fast efficient ways to uh, connect with nature so i'm just going to go through this list quite quickly the first one is sit spot which i've already talked about there's tracking learning bird language learning survival skills like all the earth skills that i practiced uh, the art of storytelling. So actually telling the story of your time in nature is really important. The art of questioning, um, being able to map like I was talking about, like having a, a kind of a mind's eye uh, view and of map of your neighborhood. Journaling, like having a nature journal is a really powerful way of, um, of making these connections and joining these dots. Using field guides, um, imagining, mind's eye imagining. So as you, you go on your wander, and you come back home to integrate, to like sens sensorily integrate the information. You, you imagine what you've just been looking at and smelling and tasting. Taking animal forms, which is part of tracking. So actually mimicking animal mimicry, taking the forms of um, animals and gratitude. So there, the list of 13, what's known as core practices of nature connection. and. Um, I could go much further into them, but I'm, I'm going to leave it there and open it up for questions um, and maybe questions around, yeah, how do we, you know, this, this theme that I'm exploring today, of how do we deepen our sense of connection? What connects us and what disconnects us? So how do we deepen our sense of belonging on the land? So I think you can use the, um, either the chat or um, the, there's a Q and A button. Um, and you can even, I think, raise your hand and Jen can unmute you. Um, so I think there's three different ways of asking questions. Unfortunately, we can't all chat. Um, so someone's just said in the Q&A, what would we put in a nature journal? That's a really great question. Um, I'd love to hear if, on the chat if anyone has a nature journal. Um, I have one that's a little bit... Um, hasn't had so many entries lately, but for a while there, I was really um, making sure that I wrote a few notes. Every time I came back from my sit spot, I would put the date, the time I went down to the sit spot, the weather, um, how I was feeling personally, because that is also making the connections between what's happening outside and what's happening inside. Um, and depending on how much time I had, I would either just jot down a few notes about what I saw um, what I noticed um, and and then if I had more time questions about what I'm curious about and that would be a great thing to put in the chat right now is a question about what are you curious about in nature right now what has your curiosity and the other thing with a nature journal is sketching so um, sketching and making maps because that integrates um, the um, experience in a much different way, in a, in a powerful way. So sketching and, and mapping. Um, so um, another question I've just seen here, do you think it's helpful to get in touch with your inner child to help your connection with nature? Absolutely, Hayley. Um, I have a feeling you probably, you probably do that yourself if you're asking that question. 
Um, for sure, I, I, my neighbor here, I've got a nine-year-old neighbor, and I took her tracking in the backyard because there was a kangaroo that got lost. And, and, um, and so I took her tracking in the backyard and we were literally just looking for, for signs, scats, tracks. And um, I put myself in child's mind, um, just asking myself the same questions that, that kids would ask, getting down on all fours, um, entering into that um, wild, timeless, unstructured way of being in the world. Um, so absolutely, skipping is a great way to instantaneously get into child's mind. Um, and for a lot of us, if we haven't had unstructured playtime in nature, then our connectivity system still needs that. If we didn't get it in childhood, then we need ample amounts of unstructured playtime in nature, which is of course what kids need in order to make those um, strings of um, connection, those ropes of connection. Um, hi, Alison. Oh, how lovely to see you on the call. Alison's wondering whether um, it'd be better to keep a separate nature journal to your general life journal. I definitely keep a separate nature journal because it gets messy. There's sketches, there's maps, and I want to be able to flick back through specifically to see um, the question, the curious questions I've asked myself in the last sit spot or the last week. So it's like picking up the thread where I left off. So, and it's just, it's lovely to have an unlined um, sketchbook um, rather than, than having lines, I find personally for my nature journal. Um, Joe's asking, where did you spend your year on the land and how much prep did you do beforehand? I spent my year on the land, um, it was northern New South Wales, about three hours south of Byron Bay, so between Coffs Harbour and Grafton, on a piece of land that I hold so dearly. Um, I did do a fair bit of preparation beforehand. I'd been studying wilderness survival skills and um, other kind of shamanic practice and ceremony and, and nature observation and awareness for a few years. Um, but you don't necessarily need to. But it was, it was a, um, a semi-facilitated um, experience. So I wasn't completely alone. And that was really important. It was what I call supported solitude. So I had ample time out on the land um, on my own, but I could connect in with, um, with other humans and, and share the stories when I needed to, which was, which was really important. So um, someone's asking, do I have any advice for, um, yeah, living and working in the CBD in terms of finding more connection with nature? The thing is, and I didn't used to believe this, and I really do believe it now, you can connect deeply with nature anywhere, even in the CBD. And the doorway in um, is through birds. The doorway in in the CBD is going to be through birds because there's bird language is an incredibly fascinating study. It's not just learning the names of the birds and the calls. It's learning what the different calls mean um, because birds have all sorts of different calls and different um, ways of communicating body language, or um, a subtle nuance in their call, um, ways of telling each other if there's a predator coming over, a raptor coming over. And so tuning into the, the birds and bird language and starting to learn bird language at your sit spot in the city um, is absolutely a doorway into deep nature connection. And of course, there's the sky and the clouds and the weather and the micro, um, the micro animals, not so much the charismatic fauna, but the this, this insects and the small creatures and the um, invertebrates. So absolutely in the CBD, um, you, can, you can definitely connect to nature. Um, Katie, I might, in terms of recommending books, I might just add some at the end in the chat. Um, that probably would be the, the uh, easiest. Um, hi, Jules, that's nice to see your name. Um, did you find yourself Where'd that question go? Did you find yourself connecting to a form of music making when you were living amongst the natural world for you, you mentioned? Well, I can understand why you would be asking that question, being an incredible um, drummer. Yeah, it's really interesting. As I've deepened um, this, as I've deepened my um, journey of deep nature connection, and this is kind of going off in a bit of a tangent, but I'll come back to music. What I've learned and understood is that what we're really doing here is cultural repair. Um, my, one of my mentors calls it cultural repair with gaffer tape. Um, it's not perfect, of course, but
but nature connection is is like the foundation of a healthy culture and you can think of the job of a culture to connect is to connect us um, and so we have connections to each other to community we have connection to self and we have connection to earth and when all those three are really strong then that's that's the foundations of a, of a healthy um, human culture and looking at the practices of indigenous cultures and healthy cultures they um, all have um, singing um, and dancing and storytelling um, as a core part and a regular part of their culture um, a really wonderful anthropologist um, Angela Arians says that when she encounters, um, when she's in indigenous cultures and someone comes to them like, you know, with feelings of depression or so forth, um, she notices this common question that, that is asked, when did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? When did you stop telling stories? So um, I absolutely feel like um, bringing in music and, and dance and storytelling is vitally part of healthy human culture vital part of telling the story and expressing the story of your nature connection um, we're running out of time but um oh greer is asking the name of the person who outlined the 13 core practices of nature connection um, a guy called john young i'll also put it in the chat function um, at the end but his organization is called the eight shields institute which has really fantastic um, resources for learning um, deep nature connection and he comes out to Australia most years to offer um, a workshop. Um, Jude is asking about food sources solely plant-based hunting feral animals. I'm not sure how to ask that curly one. Yeah it's a curly one and it's it's definitely um, a very personal subjective one whether um, yeah whether um, well for me foraging and that can include um, animals. Foraging on the land is the most powerful practice for me of, um, of connecting, uh, of connecting to, to nature because it's, it's about, it's a, it starts to develop that sense of reciprocity um, where again, I'm not just skimming along the surface, um, but I'm participating. I'm participating in the great dance and there's, the Kalahari Bushmen talk about tracking. Uh, they don't use the word tracking, they, they use the, the, this language, the great dance. Um, being, and it's, it's that sense of being a participant um, in, a, in a reciprocal relationship with nature. Um, so we take and we give and we take and we give and we give through our gratitude, we give through our caretakership. Um, and you know i'm learning so much more about what that relationship is there's some fantastic resources and i think someone mentioned bruce pascoe's work with dark emu and and again that's that's looking at this this function of of this gift of, of us being caretakers on the land um, and developing that deep um, reciprocity um, and diana's asking about where traditional owner knowledge fits into my explore, exploration of nature well, as, as much as I can possibly find and soak in um, and, and pay respects to, I, I do, Diana. And it really is a case of, um, you know, there's knowledge in so many different forms, in the field guides, in oral traditions, um, in existing um, and continuing um, Indigenous knowledge. And, yeah, it really is a case of... Um, of, of saying yes to whatever teachers I find. And a lot of that is um, direct experience on the land, but certainly I've, yeah, I've had the luxury and the privilege of spending time with different indigenous communities and up in Arnhem land, learning um, how to make incredible um, practice of making bread from cycads, which actually takes about a week um, and learning their traditional weaving techniques and Oh, there's just so many questions. And I think we only have, one more minute. Oh, you've got some poll questions for yeah. council. Know, yes, well, please. I didn't know if you wanted, to, we'll include uh, the one you had, which uh, kind of is a nice way to kind of wrap up a little bit. So it's about uh, how often do you go out on, on a wander without your phone, not knowing where you might end up. So it's kind of nice to see what people's uh, reactions are going to be to this. And maybe this will change now since hearing you. 
It's yeah. been really fantastic to hear your story, Claire, and to get you to really think about, uh, get us to think about where we live and the real deep connection with where we are. So I think I've, I've loved it. I've really enjoyed listening to you this right. morning. Thank you. Yeah, it's been wonderful to, to chat and um, not as difficult as I thought it would be just talking to my own <laughs> face on the screen. I was just imagining all your faces. <laughs> I think we've had so many people chatting, so many questions. I really think you've really sparked a lot of uh, interest and uh, uh, excitement, really. So let me just, uh, we're just going to share those results. So at the moment, we've got kind of, the majority will rarely go wandering without their phone, not knowing where they can go. But there's a few who are sometimes and a few often. So that's really good. Well, if there's any kind of um, home play that I could give you between now and um, there's talk of having another call where it's actually more of a meeting where I can see all your faces. Um, I would suggest going on a wander without your phone, um, not knowing where you're going to end up, seeing what happens. Definitely. So we've got two more questions. So apologies to everyone. These are slightly uh, more kind of council questions. So we just have to check how everyone's going. So I'm just going to launch that one as well. Um, just wanted to know how you feel really after today's webinar, if you feel that you're more likely now to immerse yourself in nature. Um, wow. I'm straight off 100%, that's looking really good at first. So yeah, so somewhat more likely, much more likely, a little less likely or not likely at all. So I'll just give you all a couple of moments to finalize those. If it's looking really positive. Let's have a look. A couple more. All right, I think we're gonna give you 10 more seconds if you haven't already. All right, so I think you've done great work there, Claire, by uh, looking at these results. Yay! <laughs> this is fantastic. So I'm really excited. This is really wonderful. It looks like people are really keen to uh, get out into nature and uh, yeah, enjoy a little bit more. So we've got one more question for everyone. Sorry, everyone, this will be the last one. And this is just for myself and my colleague, Sarah, just to sort of know if you've enjoyed today, really. This is, the, as we said, this is the first webinar we've actually ever done at Yarra Rangers Council. So um, it was a complete test for us. Uh, Claire has been incredibly wonderful and flexible with uh, being able to adapt herself to this. Um, and so we'd really like just to know if this is the sort of thing you're interested in. Um, yeah, and we'd really like to see if we can do more of these in the future. So I'll just give you another few seconds, but the results are looking really positive at the moment. I think as well, like, as you said, Claire, this is a really uh, interesting time when people aren't really as connected. So I think things like this are really wonderful ways of connecting people. Mm, yeah, well, it's in, in lieu of not being able to get together in person, it's, um, it's doing a pretty good job. As long as it doesn't become, as long as it's not the new normal. That's, <laughs> yeah. my, that's my clarifier. But that's really wonderful. I'm really excited that 98% of people and uh, majority of people, seem, everyone seems to be really keen on a, having more of these, that's really exciting. And um, as kind of Claire mentioned, what we're looking at doing as well is if people are interested in this, you'll be getting an email out uh, probably today or tomorrow, I can't remember. Um, and it'll invite to say thank you for joining this, but it'll also invite you if you're interested. Um, we're thinking of with Claire doing a less sort of public, this one's being recorded, so it's very a webinar based uh, session, but we're looking at doing a more meeting session. So everyone will be on screen, everyone will be chatting, it won't be recorded. And it'll be a slightly easier way for you to just connect, share stories, share ideas. Um, maybe we'll do this in a couple of weeks. So if people are interested, we'll have an email in that, or sorry, we'll have a registration in that email. Um, just kind of register your interest and then we will uh, keep you on a list and we'll invite you back to join with Claire in hopefully a couple of weeks. Liz, Liz has been asking how my integration was after the year in the bush and sounds like uh, something that's close to your heart, Liz. All I can say is that, um, without a longer answer, it was, it was very difficult to integrate and I wasn't prepared for that um, uh, because it changes you. If you live in a way that puts your attention on, on the more than human world and, and with that much solitude, um, it really does shift your centre of gravity and it certainly shifted my whole way of being in the world. And so coming back into to, um, four walls and, um, and internet and and more the busyness has has been really difficult um but i f feel like i'm i'm able to kind of integrate the the gifts and the and the challenges in a way that um feels like dynamic i guess and like i'm not trying to recreate that that 
purity of that situation. But my current inquiry is how to bring that into an urban setting. And I'm currently writing another book um, called Rewilding the Urban Soul, which is, which is about specifically that, about how to, how to integrate um, those experiences in the urban setting. And I was sceptical to begin with, but actually I'm finding that it's, it's a really rich landscape with so much opportunity for connection and, and, and it needs to be because most people live in the city. Um, so if we can't connect here, then we may as well pack up our toys and go home really. Um, so that's the short, short answer. Um, and you said you'd appreciate some references. Um, I would say just get in touch with me, like email me. Um, I don't have any references in terms of integration off the top of my head, but if you, if you email me, I'm just going to put my email in the chat function here. Um, then I could respond to that. Um, and Carl was keen with a question about um, sometimes with ceremonial plants and mushrooms, we can gain a closer connection with nature. Do you think we can have such a connection unassisted? And if so, how? Well, <laughs> that's probably the subject of a book. Um, I... Yeah, and it's, it's a tricky one and a controversial one. I would say quite simply, yes, ethnogens are very powerful doorways into deep connection with um, nature and with the web of life and have been used as such for countless generations. Um, and I don't know, and I, I don't know about the answer. Um, I... My experience is that um, through practices of ceremony and specifically vision quests, like sitting out on the land um, alone for, for some days and through the practices of group ceremony um, and that kind of sensory, like practicing that vast sensory awareness. So really opening up vision um, and senses, um, all the physical senses, like really switching the physical senses on, um, they have tracked that the brain waves do do shift into that theta, um, that theta kind of level where you are accessing altered states of consciousness that are way below, beyond the physical mind. So I would I would say, yes, that there are definitely um, ways to to connect in with that very, um, very powerful, otherworldly um, way of of being on the landscape that you don't need don't need ethnogens. Um, yes, um, reference guides to indigenous, um, edibles, Pam. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's the Tim Lowe books, the wild food. Um, that's a good start. Um, there's, is it Crib? Crib has another, a, a kind of good basic one. There's a guy who lives out, um, in the Dandenongs who's, who's just published a bush food book. Um, uh, Jamie Simpson and I can't think off the top of my head of, of um, indigenous edible books right away. Again, if you email me, um, I'll be able to point you in the direction of some more resources. Um, Alison saying, I struggle to come home even after a couple of hours a year would be massive. Yes. A year was massive. Maybe your resources could be added to the email that the Yarrick, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so I will, so I'll just type the, the reference of the person that I um, quoted here, just so, um, so that's there, but I will, I'll include some resources, um, some, some good field guides in the, in the email that goes out and yeah, thank you all for, for joining. I think I'm going to jump offline now and have a cup of tea. And uh, Jude, I just want to read Jude's thing. I've slept and swag for months in the backyard is what made me want more. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yeah. Well, this is one of the questions, Jude, is, is how do we meet the needs of our times, meet the needs, the soul yearning that you have to um, have more immersion um, in nature and to really deepen that connection while also paying the bills and um, and holding together a, a strong family, and it's a good question. And you know, bring the family along for the for the journey is one answer. But of course, there's lots more nuances within that. Um, yes, 
it's that would be a, a longer a longer question and for me a book that i would recommend reading um jude along those lines is a book called soulcraft by i'm just typing it by bill plotkin which talks exactly to that um to that particular yearning for um a, a much deeper experience of immersion and yet thanks andy that's janie simpson's book bush foods Bye all. Thanks for joining in. So uh, we're going to end here. So have a great day, everyone.